Hi there. My name is Elise Vu with Sinkery. We are so proud to be today's headline sponsors. Thank you for tuning into our Chief Revenue Officer event. We have another session coming up your way in just a moment. But remember, head over to salesenablementcollective.com for all of your information regarding membership plans. And don't forget to join the Slack community. Another interactive session is on its way. So be ready with your questions and comments following the talk. Now sit back and enjoy. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for tuning in to the Chief Revenue Officer Summit for another talk. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our next talk, uh, a panel discussion entitled Learn to Align Your Business Through Distributed Truth Before the Single Source of Truth derails your GTM strategy. Um, participating in the talk today, we have Elise Yu, Senior Director of Corporate Communications at Syncury, Sam Bowley, Senior Director of Revenue Operations at Metadata, and Chris Thompson, VP of Global Marketing Operations at Conga. Um, you'll also see that there's a pop-up to answer a poll It'd be great as you come in if you can let us know which category you are situated within. Um, if not, you'll see on your chat function, there's the poll tab and then you can answer there. Without further ado, I will pass over to Elise. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Will. No worries. Awesome. I'm so excited for today's panel because for the first time we have experts from marketing automation as well as RevOps sitting on one panel together. So we're going to get that nice 180-360 view. And not only that, um, I, as, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the Senior Director of Community and Corporate Comms at Sinker, and I'm just delighted and privileged to be here with Chris Thompson, who is the VP of Marketing Automation at Conga, as well as Sam Boley, who is the Senior Director of Revenue Operations at Metadata. And before we even dive in, I'd love to hand it over to Chris Thompson, who comes to us as just a complete Lead marketer, operations strategist, a problem solver, and essentially an expert at thinking essentially around a global business and how to move it faster. And so with that said, Chris, I'd love to hand it over to you to give us a brief intro. Sure. Hey, Elise. Hey, Sam. Good to be with you again, sir. So as uh, Elise said, my name is Chris Thompson. I'm Vice President of Global Marketing Operations at Conga. Conga is an enterprise SaaS business that focuses on management of the entire revenue lifecycle for go-to-market teams across the enterprise. So having spent the beginning of my career in sales and sales leadership and then uh, transitioned over the past 10 or 12 years in marketing and marketing leadership, I have a very solid understanding uh, and, and emphasis on kind of customer, customer journey, driving pipeline and driving driving revenue. So I'm excited to talk today, at least to Sam, and kind of cover some really cool uh, topics around distributed source of truth and CDPs and all kind of cool stuff. So uh, happy to be here. Thanks, Elise. Yeah, likewise. And Sam, mm -hmm. Sam comes to us from Metadata, who sits on an executive board, essentially, with his team. And he handles the complete customer life cycle at Metadata, as we all know, is an awesome company. And with that said, Sam, we've seen you do incredible work across analytics as well as data, making sure that you govern that in a sense that making sure you survey to your teams in a meaningful way. And so with that said, Sam, I'd love for you to introduce and share with us what it is that you do. Yes, thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. And um for everyone listening to this, I pay Elise to be my uh, professional hype man whenever I come into a room. Like, I can't even write that on my own. Um, <clears throat> but I've been in uh, sales ops, rev ops for 10 years plus now, um, mostly in the startup world. And now I find myself at Metadata, which is the first demand gen platform that launches paid campaign experiments and helps optimize to revenue. Most B2B marketers use metadata in order to automate the repeatable and mundane time-consuming tasks 
for campaign automation so that they can spend time doing the cool stuff like strategy and creatives. Um, and yeah, working with uh, or speaking with Chris uh, is awesome. Working with Elise is amazing. And I hope everybody gets something uh, useful out of our time together. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, it's funny. I just got back from Inbound Opstars and everyone's been saying I'm their best PR rep. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny to say that. Thank you, Sam. And Chris, it's been incredible to work with both of you. For those of you who don't know, Chris and Sam are actually our customers and also advisors too. So we're very lucky to have them on board. With that said, Will, do you have a pulse for us in terms of our audience and if they are, where they sit in their organizations? Drop it in the chat for us. And if not, at the same time, um, would also love to understand if you have a single source of truth in your organization. I know that is a very broad question and it's very subjective, um, but would love to kind of get a sense of where everyone is in their organization. Awesome. Wow. So we've got 80% revenue leaders. Um, and then we've got 20% CRO. So welcome. Super excited to have you all here. And so with that said, um, Will will drop the poll in terms of do you have a single source of truth in your organization? Yes or no, drop it in the poll and let's talk about it. And just, you know, from my lens and Chris and Sam, you know, for it's funny because for the longest time, the single source of truth has been ingrained in us that it could exist and it exists and we can all work towards it. But now what we're realizing and we're seeing is that across the board, it's not as easy as it seems, right? Ideation concepts to execution great but uh when you actually go to uh, to implement that kind of thing it's really hard especially when you work across functional teams everyone needs their own single source of truth and if your teams are working in functional silence or silos and you know every organization is different right chris at at an enterprise company, when you're working globally compared to a hyper growth company, some companies might have silos, some might not, some might function better with silos and some might not. And then you also get this, this not in tradition, but we're starting to see where marketers or sales teams start to purchase their own tools because, hey, they can't wait for, for their rev ops team or they can't wait for their sales team or ops, whoever to prove it. And now you've got a Frankenstein stack, right? And how data is not talking to each other and whatnot. So I think it's this is a really interesting topic as we, we talk about this today. And so it looks like from the poll currently today, 90% of our audience does not have a single source of truth. With that said, I will turn it over to you, Sam. Why do you think this is? And how has your team taken an approach towards working at, perhaps with a single source of truth or a unified source of truth across your organization? Yeah. So at Metadata, um, I would say that I tried to start out with a single source of truth and let Salesforce be that authoritative source of record. Um, but as the business grows and, you know, everything that comes along with hyper growth mode, it just isn't a sustainable thing to keep shoving records into Salesforce for things that may not be relevant. So I, I absolutely adhere to a distributed source of truth. Wow. Can't say that fast. A distributed source of truth concept, but I still try to surface the pertinent data to the go to market team in a single pane of glass. So the authoritative source can be in our, in our particular situation, like the metadata itself platform has all of its data. And I pluck out what I need from that and share it with the reps in terms of product adoption, power users, et cetera, so that they can make the best go to market decisions possible. So that's how we leverage distributed truth with a kind of a single pane of glass. 
And that is such a dream state for a lot of organizations today, too. So kudos to you for achieving that. And your reps must really appreciate you because I've been in organizations where <laughs> where it, it it's so it just you just feel like it's a black hole. Right. And you don't know where or what a, a customer looks like or where they are in their journey. So, wow, I, I'm so impressed by that. Um, Chris, tell us about your organization and how your team has been working towards a single source of truth as it makes sense today. Yeah. So single source of truth, but what, what in the world does that mean? So, you know, to give some color and context, so, uh, Conga in terms of the size of metadata, we're, we're, we're fairly significantly different. So we're 1500 employees kind of globally doing business, uh, all, all around the globe. So. If you say the single source of truth that's a CRM, my answer would be, well, which one? What if you have multiple ones like we do, right? If you have multiple instances of Salesforce and your you know, center of your data universe is in fact your Salesforce, what do you do with multiple ones? Let me give you an answer this way, Elise. So we just went through an exercise uh, with an outside uh, consultancy to answer one question. It took 60 days. And one question we tried to answer was, what is an account? Four words, right? One simple sentence. What is an account? And we went around and we we talked with finance leaders. We talked with our professional services team, our implementation team, our renewals team, our product team, our sales team, our marketing team. I don't think anybody in this audience can be surprised that the answer is what is an account was actually different across all of those different components. So I like to describe a single source of truth like this. What the goal is, is to let's put it. I'm a car guy. So let's use a car analogy here. So. What we're trying to do with single source of truth is have a vehicle that can tow like an F-350. It can tote the kids around to all the soccer practices and games like an SUV. It has the fuel economy of an econo, you know, economy little four-door hatchback, but it has the performance and horsepower and speed of a, a Ferrari hypercar all together in one thing. Now, we know that that unicorn doesn't exist, right? There's no such thing. You're always having to do trade-offs. So trying to force a large enterprise or trying to drive towards a single source of truth model is like trying to get this unicorn of a car. It's got everything that you want, but nothing you don't. The reality is that doesn't exist. Um, so moving towards a single source of truth for us has been incredibly difficult. We've been through these ebbs and flows. We were driving towards a unified source of truth over the past couple of years. But now we've had an inflection point in our business where we said, wait a minute. We can't do this going forward to Sam's point. It's no longer scalable. It's not repeatable and scalable because the single source of truth that the accounting team and the finance team and the rev, rev, uh, rev rec team is the ERP. The single source of truth that the sales team is the sales force. Marketing single source of truth as a marketing automation platform, much like Marketo, we use Marketo as an example. So what is a single source of truth? The reality is we've been driving towards this kind of philosophical unicorn of, of the, the CRM as a center of the universe. And it's just not practical. It's not scalable. And when you begin to ingest additional points of data and data enrichment to help drive your RevOps team and drive your go-to-market engine, you start bolting things on, you quickly realize that you can't have this SUV that can pull, you know, uh, pull a fifth wheel and go 230 miles an hour and get you know four billion miles to the gallon, right? That, that, that it, it's impossible, and it doesn't work, and it doesn't scale. So we're currently at the inflection point, at least, where we're moving away from a single source of truth kind of philosophy into this distributed source of of, of truth model. And uh, so far, we've seen that tremendous success from it as we move through this fiscal year into next. Yeah, that's a great point, and maybe that's a. I, I want to follow up with that in the terms of as you think about moving towards a distributed truth and you think about these other tools that you're starting to bolt on, you know, what kind of mindset or framework are you are you applying that allows you to then think long term that, OK, if we bolt these on, that we would then get to this distributed truth? What preemptive measures are you taking and thinking of? Yeah, so a, a couple of a couple of thoughts on this. I know Sam's got some good ones too. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of thoughts on this. So first is, you know, having the ability of data normalization across all your your individual uh, you know sources of truth. So what does that mean? So you have to have uh, aligned aligned definitions of what things are in the business. Much like my my statement earlier about trying to define what is an account. We had to get the business to to come to and align on a corporate 
definition of what is an account. You have to do the same thing with what is pipeline. When is pipeline created? What's the unified and aligned definition of exactly when pipeline is created? What is, you know, your, your close one, close loss, right? I mean, these are kind of big, easy things you think, and most businesses have got figured out. But you have to align along uh, across all of the different business units, a very clear, you know, kind of data dictionary, if you will. So that's kind of step, step, number, step number one. The next thing is how do you normalize the data across all these different uh, individual sources of truth, right? Um, and then what's the window pane of the user in order to see this, see this data? And the window pane that, you know, I think from a prospecting perspective or from a go-to-market perspective, that window pane is typically Salesforce for the prospecting teams. Well, that window pane is different depending upon who you're asking. So how are you unifying the view through a single pane of glass and, and defining what that is and then building these individual systems and all the connective tissue, which Syncri is, is as Elise said, we're uh, a Syncri customer. Syncri allows us to be able to build all of those connections to all the different things. If you think of it in this way, you say, well, hey, we want to drive from Denver to Atlanta. We can stay on the interstate the whole way, but we can also go 74,000 different ways from Denver to Atlanta that doesn't involve the interstate. We can't just think things of this kind of interstate highway system. What are the different ways? What's the best way? Where are we aggregating data in other places? And how are we making that journey with an emphasis on the customer experience? Ultimately is what's kind of driving this, this unification and normalization of the data using this distributed source of truth model. Yeah, that's a great point that all of those things need to happen in between. I think often sometimes if you're still educating stakeholders, you're it, they often think, okay, we'll just do it already, but it, it's a lot harder than, than that, right? Um, so appreciate that perspective. And and Sam, I want to give this one to you is in terms of, as you think about what Chris just said, and creating this, this pain, as you had mentioned earlier, a unified view, in terms of misalignment across the business and the impact of it, if you didn't have this single pane view for your teams to work with what what did that misalignment look like and what could it how could it impact your business well i think a misalignment would be catastrophic right um so two two quick thoughts one in metadata i'm i'm blessed to work with with great leaders who all believe in in data as a decision making model and so they're all for Whatever we got to do to get the, the right data at the right time to make the best decision that we can. So, you know, I'm blessed, and I know that, and I don't, I don't take it for granted, because uh, I would imagine a lot of people out there that's probably not the case. Um, but in terms of you know actual misalignment, I think in our situation, it would lead to to no action, right? If it just wouldn't happen. Um, if if we had a if let me form my words better if the distributed truth wasn't available right if we had to shove everything into salesforce right you're talking about a time consuming arduous process for connectivity everywhere and then maintenance of it all we would just skip like it just wouldn't happen there would be pieces to the puzzle that we would knowingly leave out because it's just the time, been, the time to ROI benefit just isn't there. Mm -hmm. Allowing for the business to go with a distributed truth model using something like Syncury in order to, to pluck the best pieces of each of the silos and get them to the cross-collaborative stakeholders when and where they need them allows that to, to work. And we can do things that we would normally wouldn't have been able to do. And it impacts go-to-market um, magnificently. Mm -hmm. And I think just to echo that too, on the receiving end, I would imagine that it impacts the customer journey entirely from leads to billings from start to finish, right? Because if they don't have this insight that is actionable, how can they create those targeted campaigns or outreach or touch points to drive action, 
right? Or to onboard or to even just help perhaps from a customer service perspective or customer success perspective, help the customer be successful and or land and expand as well. So that I, I'm really glad you brought that up because Chris, I, I'm curious to think about this question is as you think about creating more GTM alignment through this single pane view and distributed truth, how have you and your team seen more GTM alignment as a result and what have those kind of benefits been? Yes. So let me tell you the problem that well, I'll answer that with telling you the problem we were trying to solve. The problem we we're trying to solve is how do we move away from the idea that the customer journey uh, is linear, it has a start and an end, right? I mean, okay. You start as a prospect, you start on a named account list, you're, you're starting, you know, based upon some kind of data point and then there's an end. Well, that isn't the case at all, especially in the, in the software business where you have, you know, uh, bookings and ultimately you're driving towards, you know, kind of net and gross retention rates and, and your, 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 your big goal is to retain the customers that you already have, the renewals, et cetera. There has to be an emphasis on a very circular style customer journey. So how can we um, improve efficiencies across the business through each individual part as we're moving, as the customer journey is going around, going around this circle? So that was the problem that we were trying to solve. Some of the other things that that where the misalignment was occurring was we were providing a customer experience to to our our, our prospects, our future customers, and then our customers that was very segmented and broken and abrupt, and they felt it right. So they would have a very different experience in the initial BDR SDR engagement. Um, then they would have a very kind of a, a abrupt and, and very felt and recognized difference. From the engagement of the AE through the kind of normal uh, kind of you know, sales journey and, and, and prospecting phase. And then once it became a customer, there was a very kind of abrupt and, and, and different feel from the implementation and then the professional services team. And then that same thing happened you know, all, all the way across the, the, the journey, including through renewals and et cetera. So we were trying to solve this like, big company problem that says, how do we ensure a very kind of circular approach to the customer journey and make these transitions easy and simple and seamless to our, to our customers? So we had to align as a go-to-market team with product, with our PS leaders, with our, our renewal leaders, with our CS team, all driving towards this, this you know, distributed source of truth that says, hey, I have to be able to see all this information. Marketing has to be able to get ahead of cross-sell and upsell opportunities prior to renewals, but they can't do that unless they've got some product data that's brought into this distributed source of truth. Well, that happens to live in another silo, right? That, that product data lives somewhere else. And you've got our LMA or the license management application that controls provisioning. Well, the renewals team has to know that. Well, so does the AE. The AE has to be able to see from a compliance perspective on, our, on, uh, on renewal, hey, you bought a thousand license years, you're at 1800, we've got a compliance thing here. That compliance push to drive additional revenue is a very valuable tool for software companies that are gonna seed with a seed-based model. So it all started with, we've got to focus on the customer journey. And that led us to the recognition that there is this distributed source of truth. We as a business have to, to align, not just within go-to-market, but align with all the, the, the different leaders that touch that customer journey around the whole you know, uh, the customer life cycle. So that, that is where our emphasis has been over the past 12 or 18 months and where it will be for the next 12 or 18 months to build efficiencies in the process, to ensure that the sales reps and people are prosecuting and, 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 and as efficiently as possible. And then ultimately tracking KPIs is we're, we're monitoring the efficacy of this whole process as we mature as a, as a business. Yeah, this is great. And just, you know, as a segue to that, I know, well, can you tell us a little bit about how Syncree is playing a part of this and then essentially how perhaps Syncree is probably helping your team move away from Salesforce as your essentially data universe? I'd love yes. to hear more about that. Yeah. So uh, I'll give you um, a very, a very specific example. So in terms of product data, so you would think at a company of our size uh, and our, and our scale and our growth rate that we would be able to answer the question, how many customers have product A? How many customers have product B? Then the question goes, well, how many customers have product A and B, but not C, right? These, these kind of very fundamental, easy, if you would think and easy in terms of identifying that was a very difficult uh, thing for us to do because we were trying to shove everything kind of into, into Salesforce with a single source of truth model, but found that, you know, that 
the uh, car analogy I gave earlier, it wasn't wasn't working. So we actually didn't have the data to answer these very basic questions. So with Synchery, one of the things that we did was we connected Synchery with our uh, product telemetry data set. We connected Synchery with our, our uh, license, our LMA, and our ability to see what's provisioned and what's not for a customer. We then connected in uh, Marketo from a person perspective so we could mark it to and know at the individual person level, like, hey, Elise is at ABC Co., and ABC Co. owns these products. Therefore, you know, we know that Elise, as a contact, we can market or cross-sell or upsell to her based upon you know, what product um, that her, the account she's associated with, the business she worked for, and what you have. And then we also then write that back to uh, onto the Salesforce record on the standard account objects. So our CS team can look at that and say, hey, we're going up for 90 days or 120 days before renewal, or somebody calls in uh, and we're an assigned CSM model. So our, our CSM team is assigned to you know, ABC Co. They can look right there very quickly when that message comes in or they're on the phone and see, hey, we recognize that you have product A and B and C and D, et cetera. That wasn't possible before we brought in Synchory to connect all these individual distributed sources of truth connect them together and provide value to the CS organization, provide value to the sales organization, provide value to the marketing organization. And ultimately from a reporting and KPI perspective, we can finally answer with a very high sense of accuracy, what customers have what products in an easy, searchable, repeatable fashion. This makes me so happy because for me as a buyer, if you're able to share that level of insight with me without me having to share with you, then I forever and probably your client and or customer, right? Not only does it build that brand affinity and loyalty, but it makes you even more credible. And you know, for I know for a fact that you know who I am and I'm essentially a valued customer. Mm -hmm. No one as a customer wants to repeat themselves five times with the same answer that yes, I am your customer and no, I unsubscribed or I, I subscribed at this level five times. So that that is incredible. Sam, this is this is the next question for you is in terms of, you know, earlier you talked about how Synchory and perhaps creating the single pane of view for your, your teams have enabled you more actions, right? Can you talk to us more about that and how Synchory has helped you become a more profitable company and grow? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and much the same way as Chris, it starts with the product data. Um so, but our, the problem that we were trying to solve is retention, right? We're a marketing organization or a marketing technology organization and churn is an issue for everybody. And so what we knew is we had all of this product data. We knew how our customers were using the platform. So what does good look like and what does I need to step in and um, be preemptive with this customer because things could be going off the rails. And so we had all this data, we dumped it into Excel. Yours truly did uh, VLOOKUP nightmares and uh, spreadsheet hell and came up with hypothesis. And it gave us the baseline of a customer health score based off of product usage. But as soon as you put it in a spreadsheet, it's stale, it's old, it's outdated. And so lo and behold, here comes Syncury and now I can take the product usage data from our platform. I can format it, normalize the data, put it into Salesforce, and we use that to create customer health scores that update in real time and feed it to our CSMs and our AEs so they know, hey, this customer is ripe for an upsell or, hey, this customer is not using the product based, not using the product indicative of somebody who is likely to renew. And so they can take prescriptive actions. Once we got that operationalized, we took it one step further and we go, okay, instead of working our ICP, ideal customer profile, as clients that are likely to buy, if we're solving for net retention, gross retention, why don't we base it on the customers who are likely to upsell and renew? So mm -hmm. we took that product data, we took the customer health scores, we looked at firmographic data, anything that we could get our hands on, and we fed it all to marketing and go, 
these are the these are the customers that are likely to renew and upsell. Let's focus our ICP there and focus our marketing efforts there so that churn down the line isn't as impacted by the early hand raisers that are kicking the tires, but not likely to renew and upsell. So it is that full 360 data feeding engine of, hey, we know what good customers look like and let's get more of those and feed it all the way back to the top of the funnel. Yeah, I love how you're intentional about that as a team too, right? Asking those questions because I think oftentimes we get so busy that we forget to ask and then we're we're wondering where are the leads at? Where are the leads at? But when in fact they might already be in your data stack and you just need to surface it in a way that is meaningful and finding those high intent opportunities. I think that that's a great point. Awesome. Um, we have a question from the audience and it looks like they want to know from actually Trish wrote this question. So how do you approach stakeholder buy-in and how have you earned their trust to create a distributed truth? I know Chris earlier, you had alluded to this a tad bit by working with a third party consultant to define your data dictionary. What is an account? Um, do you have anything else to add there? And then I would love to get Sam's take on this too. Yeah, so imagine the conversation uh, when 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 myself and my counterpart on the, the other half of the go-to-market operations team brought this idea to senior leaders around the business, our peers, and to say, hey, we want to start moving away from Salesforce being the center of our data universe. I mean, you can imagine the looks we got, right? They're like, well, wait a minute. We've been working for like two years to do that. Why would you unravel it? Well, when, when you talk about the conversation and and the way to surface the right data at the right time to the right people so we can uh, efficiently and effectively prosecute the demand that we're driving, right? Increase the, the win rate and also drive down the kind of average days, average days uh, to close our sales cycle numbers by ensuring efficiency with the sales team, efficiency with the marketing team, and then ultimately taking the same approach with our renewals and our PS and our implementation team and our services team to take that same approach and to show them that there's a, what good really looks like, we got some immediate interest. Now here's where the next step I think is incredibly valuable. And the next step really is that there has to be in the end, executive level buy-in, but don't start there. Mm -hmm. Start with the senior leaders. I, what I did is I started with every senior leader who was a direct report to the C-suite, who were my direct peers, to begin the conversations, get them excited, sell them the value of this change in the model and change in how we were going to run our, our business individually and focus it on the value of their specific example of their organization. So meeting with as a CS, as an example, meeting with a CS organization, showing them the efficiencies that they could have in running and managing the renewals business. If they had access to this certain data at the right time in the right, you know, kind of pane of glass, um, you know, how we can how we can execute on that to get their buy in. I did the same thing with the finance team, same thing all across the board. So once we got the buy in at the senior leader level, again, kind of one right underneath the C-suite and we engage the C-suite in conversations around a distributed source of truth model and not all, but the vast majority of their direct reports are going nudging them. Hey, boss, love this. We got to do this right um, we got buy-in at the executive level in a, a, a relatively quick fashion because we started with kind of more of the operators, started with the kind of operations leaders' heads, and then kind of went through went through the process that way. So we, we took a bottom as kind of up approach instead of a tops down, um, and that worked really well for us. So I think that's a repeatable and scalable model that I would recommend um, to, to others out there who are interested in doing the same thing. Yeah, I think that's a great point, right? Especially in some organizations where um, at that level, you might be even potentially advisors to your executive team because you're the expert in your field, right? Sure. Awesome. And Sam, what are your thoughts on this? How did you, how do you approach stakeholder buy-in and how have you earned their trust to create a single pain view? Well, I'm fairly abrupt and brusque in my tone. Um, you know, I'm sure you can kind of pick that up already. And so when I was hired, it was to solve a, a series of problems. And I walk in and I, that's what, this is what I do. Here is the data scoreboard. Don't lie. Um, 
and just approach it that way and earn credibility. I did start at the top down, but we're a much smaller organization. You know, we're between 150 and 200 employees. And so it's easier to start at the top down in that situation, um, mostly because there's not a lot of mid-management and certainly not when I started at Metadata or most other startups. And so it's easy to go in and go, here is the data, right? And if you want to ask further questions, and you should, you should be asking A, B, and C questions based off of this in order to extrapolate out we're going to need to do additional data architecture and distributed truth is the right answer in that situation. And so when you come in and you're immediately solving problems and building credibility, when you propose further solutions, it's less up for debate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, we have another question from the audience and this is for you, Chris, is, what are your best practices for someone who is getting started on their path towards creating distributed truth? Yeah, that's a good question. I think this one, to Sam's point, is really dependent upon kind of size of your organization, the kind of where you're at in your in your growth cycle, uh, et cetera. But I'll kind of answer it in more generic terms. I think the first the first thing is you don't have the debate single source of truth versus distributed to truth. What you start with is what fundamental questions as a business are we trying to answer? What do we struggle with today? Where are we not good today? Where have we identified what good does not look like? And then take it one layer below that. Then identify, all right, well, is that anecdotal evidence or is that factual kind of data-driven ev evidence? And what we found was that, that it was, I would say, mostly data-driven that we could identify and prove, in fact, that we were not good in certain places or certain areas of our, of our go-to-market engine. So once we define, hey, what are we not good at? What questions we struggle with answering? Proving in the data, we then said, all right, everything is off the table. Don't imagine Salesforce as the center of the universe. Don't even think about that. Think about what, it, what capabilities, what questions, and how could we answer? How could we be better? To use Sam's phrase, what does good look like if we said, don't worry about the data or the architecture, assume we could get it and assume that it would be presented the right data at the right time for the right people to make the right decisions. With all of those assumptions in, in, in place, the natural conclusion you get to is you can't have a single source of truth. You have to have a distributed source of truth model to be able to efficiently at scale and a repeatable process, be able to answer those continuing questions that businesses ask you know, to continue to drive their drive their growth. So it's very obvious for us in the end that, hey, we cannot literally shove, you know, thousand boxes into the back of this SUV by car analogy again um, and expect it to function because it, it just can't. We want to know, just like UPS or FedEx does, right, delivers your package on the day that you asked it with the product that you mm -hmm. desired at the price point in which you, you know, agreed to. So we got to take that very specific kind of delivery approach. And that got us to the realization that distributed truth across our data model and across our different infrastructure pillars was really only our most are really the only way where we were going to get and continue to drive growth and answer the questions. And it was pretty unanimous at that point. Yeah. And might I add to that as customers, we're getting smarter and we want more targeted experiences, right? And to that example, if Amazon is dropping off a package, I actually probably want to open my garage or have them open my garage, put the product in there and then off they go, right? Especially with with what we're seeing out there today in terms of, you know, porch theft or or whatever we call them today, pirate thefts. <laughs> anyway, in that same vein, I did want to ask the both of you, um, and this is, I'll start with you, Chris, is as a marketing operations professional, talking about what RevOps folks used to do and what they do today, um, but the new way rather, is how, how have you seen in the past few years the rise of RevOps and what does that look like today? Yeah, so I think a couple of thoughts. One is that the past five or seven years, there's been an, uh, uh, an increase, an insatiable appetite for being data driven. So if you recall five or 10 years ago, if you kind of classified yourself as individuals or business that we are data driven, 
um, you were relatively kind of near the tip of the spear five or 10 years ago, whereas now it's table stakes. You, you can't run a business and you as a leader anywhere in the go-to-market team, rev ops, marketing ops, sales ops, field ops, any of those, you, you, you have to be expected or you are expected and you have to be knowledgeable in both data and technology and kind of automation and, and process. So first of all, it's, it's satisfying that insatiable appetite to be data driven. That's a really big change. And I think another uh, big change is uh, the, the evolution of the operations teams to be more focused on the customer journey, the customer experience, and be very kind of company uh, holistic. And what I mean by that is if my success and my team's success for Conga as we continue to, to, to grow through our, our different uh, growth cycles, if I was only to focus on, hey, just marketing, if I was only to focus on, all right, in the traditional definition, hey, marketing focuses from the, you know, uh, the demand creation through kind of leads and that traditional kind of waterfall model up until opportunity, then I take the football and I, I chuck it to someone else and go, hey, you know, marketing and marketing operations, our part is done. Now let's on to you guys. Uh, that, that is a not. That is, that is a model that no longer uh, can you know, support a go-to-market team. So you have to cover more bases than just your internal discipline. So my expectation of myself and my team and the expectation of the whole go-to-market operations team is that we have to be far more, you know, have a higher kind of or, or further reaching breadth of scope and knowledge and increase our sphere of influence across the business. So how can I add value? How can my team add value along with the other go-to-market operations teams to the entire customer journey, that kind of circular journey I talked about earlier. How can we provide and add value for renewals and CS? And then how can renewals and CS add value to us? How do we co-market? How do we, you know, I, all of that is is one big kind of family now where years past it was very, very segmented and, and broken out. So the future and success, I think marketing operations as a kind of function is probably on its last legs with the rise of RevOps. And I think it's a good thing, by the way, because we're driving towards this kind of very customer centric complete go-to-market fo focus model instead of this very siloed, you know, kind of baton handoff. This isn't a four by 100 re relay race. We're all running at the same time, you know? Um, so that, that's a, another really big change I've seen. I think so too. And in some organizations I've seen, you know, IT used to play the quarterback on connecting these systems and we used to wait on them. And now for the first time, even across organizations I'm seeing, it looks like RevOps gets, to take the lead. And Sam, this is for you. You mentioned this in one of our conversations. You said, you said, I speak with data. And it's funny, data doesn't lie. And so how, talk to us a little bit about that. And how have you seen the impact of ops from your view and shift? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think the, I think the future of RevOps is, is still being written, right? Um, I, in, I could easily envision a world where it's its own org that is not rolling up through uh, sales or marketing or anything else and just stands as its own, own independent team, maybe underneath the CEO or the COO, um, because it acts as an independent entity that has its own authoritative voice. Um, and to piggyback exactly on what Chris said is like years ago, it was just about getting the data and becoming data driven. And now with the proliferation of data everywhere, um, I would say that RevOps has the additional new responsibility of filtering out the noise and servicing only the pertinent data, the pertinent signals um, to the right stakeholders at the right time, because now you can easily inundate everybody with, spreadsheets and fields and data and scores and whatever you want to throw at them. But what matters the most? What should they be paying attention to? And I think RevOps is becoming that first filter of, of what is the most important of all the things that are being thrown at you. A hundred percent. In my world, I would call those high impact levers. <laughs> Awesome. In that same vein, would love to hear from you, Sam, in terms of this approach of creating a unified distributed truth. How has this enabled your organization to move faster? Um, we move really fast now. 
like uh, with like the customer the, the customer usage data, the product data, it we know very quickly when somebody is over allocated, as Chris talked about earlier on licenses or the you know they're behind on where they should be even in the month in terms of what performance should look like and allow us to get in front of it to surface signals for preemptive uh, retention measures or coaching or being able to surface data to the clients in order to allow them to use the product better, more efficiently. So everything that allows us to try to become the trusted advisor to our customers is as a result of being able to leverage product usage data. And that would not be possible at the speed that we're trying to utilize it without distributed truth and syncery as the, as the strings that connect everything together. Yeah, that's awesome. And Chris, what are your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, so I, I, I echo a lot what, what, what Sam says. It's, it's interesting. I think the, I think the dynamics between the sizes of organizations, um, really, really matter really kind of make a difference on how it's all approached. Um, and I know we're at time want to be sensitive. Um, we're, we're also at, at time, so we'll, we'll probably get wrapping here, but, um, yeah. And, and, and with that vein, we'll, I'll go ahead and finish up, but yeah, I agree. I agree with Sam for sure. Awesome. Well, Sam, Chris, appreciate both of your time today. I think there are a number of takeaways that we all can certainly take and implement across our organizations. If you, the audience has any questions, please reach out to Chris, Sam, or myself on LinkedIn. We're always around and it was a pleasure. Thank you all and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.